Um, so I, I, I made my uh, presentation or the proposal to uh, Erlang Factory, and I, I realized that wow, I wrote something for like two or three hours worth of, of time. And so uh, I'll have a lot of text on these slides, and some of them I'm going to gloss over. Um, you can find uh, via, via Twitter, um, I, just, I just mentioned where to find a link for this. So if you want to use it as reference material or for chasing down things um, uh, after the talk, feel free to do so. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Basho Japan, um, and uh, I've been using Unix since 1986 and using Erlang since uh, 2000. Um, I've given uh, talks before at Erlang User Conference and, and, uh, and uh, Erlang Factory. Um, so I hope that qualifies me for something. Feel free to, to check whatever box it is on the, on the rating thing as you, as you go out. Uh, we really appreciate the, the, the feedback. Um, so I have this online, both the, the long-term URL and, and today looking at Twitter if you want to go find the, the full text of this. Um, and I'll include uh, both here and later through the presentation links to all of the GitHub repos and, and whatever else for the, the tools that I, I talk about. Um, so today's focus is, is on profiling Erlang code. So this is code that you've already identified um, as being suspect um, uh, using the use method or some other kind of measurement-based uh, methodology. Um, and I'm going to emphasize measurement a lot because your guesses are always wrong. Your guesses are always wrong. My guesses are always wrong. Um, so I'm going to be recommending multiple methods. Um, and these uh, flame graphs are one tool um, that are a little bit new that many people maybe uh, are not uh, quite familiar with. Um, but they're not perfect either. Uh, and in fact, they lie. Uh, all the profiling tools that we have in our tool chest as Erlang developers, uh, they lie. And I was putting some photos together uh, for this talk, and then I realized that everyone had a beard. Beards are not required um, for this. So, they do help. <laughs> well, they, they do help in very cold weather. But aside from that, um, so given, uh, given that we're interested in profiling Erlang code very specifically, then we want to identify Erlang uh, function or functions that are consuming the most CPU uh, resource. So you can measure that in terms of wall clock time, uh, or on scheduler time, and in fact, depending on what measurement technique you're using, you may get one or the other, and they will tell you different results as the, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the profiling. So um, if you don't know Brendan Gregg, there's his photo, um, he is bearded, sorry about that. Um, he's written an excellent book, I highly recommend this book if you have to do code profiling uh, or systems uh, profiling or benchmarking. Um, so what he says about benchmarking, I'll take some quotes, and I'll probably use the word benchmarking and profiling a little bit interchangeably, and I shouldn't do that, but I probably will, uh, and I apologize for that. Um, did I say I recommend this book? This is a really good book. Um, so he describes passive benchmarking as you pick a tool, and you kind of run it, you follow the readme or something, and you make a slide deck of the results, you give it to management, and you're done. And uh, uh, what actually happens is, you do this thing A, but you've really measured some other thing B, and you conclude, well, I measured C, <laughs> right? So if you're doing this benchmarking in a passive manner, um, you know, here, um, you, you tell management, I measured C, and really you've measured crap. You, you didn't know what you were measuring. Um, so, you know, this is kind of a conundrum, whether you're doing profiling for a small amount of code or profiling for uh, a larger system. And um, Greg recommends uh, active benchmarking, where you analyze the performance while the system is running. And you, you're not doing post-mortem, but you use other tools to actively monitor or probe the system, make certain that it's behaving the way you expect it to. Is the test doing what it's supposed to do, uh, like a test case load generator or whatever? Um, does the system under test actually respond to the test in the appropriate way? Are you calling like no op functions uh, or something like that? Um, so then you can understand what are the true limiters of the system under test um, and the true limiters of the test itself. Maybe you're using a load generator and the load generator is misconfigured or has a bottleneck where it's speaking over uh, 10 base T Ethernet rather than gigabit Ethernet or something like that. That stuff happens now and then. Um, so for active profiling, we want to understand what the workload does, what the code under test, how it actually responds to the workload. What are the true limiters of the code? That's, that's our goal. Point number three is the goal that we've set for ourselves. Um, 
but we also need to know some of the limiters of the profiler tool itself. You want to measure because your guesses are wrong. Um, and these tools, um, they have some limitations, and so they're going to lie to you. Um, uh, uh, Martin Schellen and uh, Roberto Elwa, they, they had a good presentation uh, about a year ago uh, at EUC, and uh, <laughs> they're, they're stressing measurement too, right? So don't guess, trust your measurements, um, and know what you're measuring. Um, so Lucas Larson, who's maybe here in the, in the room, <laughs> so, <laughs> so a talk he gave last year at EUC at about minute 31, he says, profiling is inherently difficult. You have to be aware of the entire stack. Well, I've been using Erlang for f 15 years. I don't know the whole stack either. I mean, this, this is just sort of a short list of parts of the stack in an in a Erlang system, uh, memory management, operating system threads, the Erlang process uh, schedulers. File I.O. is this deep, dark box that not many people are aware of, but it doesn't work like it does in Python or Perl or, uh, or C. Um, so um, i skip ahead. Didn't I have a, oh shoot, I had another quote uh, from, uh, oh, that was a quote from Garrett, I'm sorry. Um, Erlang is an operating system for your code. Um, so um, if you don't know where to start, uh, Brennan Gregg in the uh, systems performance book, he recommends uh, one method out of several, and it's called the use method, utilization, saturation, and errors. So um, uh, the errors are usually the easiest to find. They're usually loud, especially in an Erlang system, uh, the, the SASL error logger. If there are errors there, you should be looking at those first. Um, you don't have to use fancy tools frequently to, to see that there are errors that may be perturbing your system. Um, then, more often than not, looking for saturation rates um, uh, is easiest to do, and utilization is the third place you would look. But if you, you, you look at these three things and find the, uh, uh, iterate on the use method to, to take a closer look at the saturation rates or the error rates, perhaps fix a bottleneck, and then go back to step number one and repeat until your system is fast enough. Um, and there's a longer blog post uh, about this. Um, uh, so Shell and, El and uh, Elwa, they say, well, at the operating system level, you can look at these things. In the, in the Erlang world, there's elapsed wall clock time uh, for execution of uh, processes, message queue lengths uh, across the system, number of uh, reductions executed by processes, garbage collection events, and how long they are, uh, and so on. So um, the talk proposal, I had also mentioned kind of making a survey of tools available today. I don't have time for that, and I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to just kind of mention them here uh, with a lot of text. Uh, feel free to look them up later um, if you're not familiar with them. Um, the second half of my talk, I'll focus uh, uh, most of the time on uh, flame graphs. Um, so um, in, uh, I have a couple of different categories, one for things that are bundled along with OTP uh, in the distribution one way or another, uh, except for Percept, sorry. Um, but since so many of the people involved in the Percept project uh, and the research groups around it, I included it in the OTP source, especially since version one of Percept uh, actually is uh, in OTP. So some of these measure um, uh, activity by Erlang code uh, kind of more directly. Uh, instrument um, is for uh, looking at uh, uh, memory allocator uh, activity inside the virtual machine. Uh, the lock counter for looking at uh, data structures in the virtual machine that still use locks. And since each iteration now uh, with 16 and 17 and 18 are using fewer and fewer lock-based uh, data structures, that, that tool, I don't, I don't know what you're supposed to use for looking for contention on the, on the lockless ones. Is there? Gut feeling. Gut feeling. Oh, great. Guessing. <laughs> right. Don't do that. OK. So and there's also the efficiency guide um, to, uh, to take a peek at. Um, uh, outside of Erlang, um, I'm a big fan of the EPR package, of specifically Redbug. Uh, Fred Hibbert's package, uh, Recon, and his uh, electronic book, uh, Stuff Goes Bad, uh, Erlang and Anger. <laughs> Highly recommend that, too. Um, uh, someone at lunch, uh, Dimitri, was telling me about EEP um, that uh, I need to do some more research on. But one of the things that it can do is take tracing information from Erlang uh, and uh, put it into a format that you can then feed into the K uh, K-Cache grind tool 
uh, for visualizing the, the uh, uh, stack trace, uh, stack aware uh, profiling information. Um, if you want to look at the Erlang virtual machine internals themselves, you can use any of the tools that are uh, available in, in uh, looking at uh, C and C++ programs, GProf, uh, Valgrind, um, uh, Dtrace, and SystemTap, and so on. Um, there are other measurement techniques um, on the command line or in compiled code. You can use the timer uh, TC function. Um, please be aware of that code that is executed as you type on the CLI is interpreted and executed in a different way and has different timing characteristics than if it's compiled. So please be aware of that if you're using the timer TC uh, command on the, uh, 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 at the shell. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the latency histogram tracer, um, which is uh, quite useful um, for uh, executing a function a bunch of times and then getting detailed statistics about the latency of each one of those calls. Um, you can also use uh, dtrace and system tap, uh, add some annotations to your code. So here I have examples of uh, uh, adding for probe number 25 of the Erlang uh, user uh, trace. Uh, we uh, uh, activate the probe with one at the start of what we want to time and a two when we're done. And then in a dtrace, uh, we would look for this probe that fires the Erlang and then with PID number with um, the argument of one or two, which would tell us the start and ending time. And then we have nanosecond resolution uh, uh, granularity for, for uh, calculating latencies. Um, but it does require having uh, uh, the Dynetrace uh, dynamic trace support uh, compiled into your virtual machine. Um, and here's some output uh, from the from, uh, uh, tracing module that I had created. So I have uh, a React running. I'm trying to test this function uh, bitcask put uh, error D3. I run it for 10 seconds, uh, wait for 10 seconds, and I get a histogram. The minimum latency time in, uh, uh, pardon me, milliseconds was uh, zero. Maximum was 48. The mean variance, standard deviation, uh, 50th percentile was three milliseconds, 90 at five milliseconds, 99.9th at 14. There were 51,000 uh, some uh, uh, function calls and then a breakdown um, in terms of at one millisecond there were 13,000 calls and so on. So this gives you a much more detailed picture of, of how long that ERID3 function was, was uh, executing each of those uh, 51,000 times. You did turn off the variable CPU clock speed feature, right? When you're doing this testing, how many people forget to do this when they're benchmarking or profiling their code? Turn it off. Turn it off. Um, uh, any questions at, at this point? I'm going to kind of segue into the next point and talk about why so many of the tools that we have are based on uh, Erlang tracing, um, why we use it, why we think it's cool, um, and some of the limitations. Um, Okay. Oh, sure. Uh, you, you listed a whole bunch of tools. Are, they, are most of them applicable to any Beam language, or are they all, or, or how many of them are airline specific? Um, they should. Um, when I say profiling airline code, I mean Beam code more specifically. So they should be applicable to um, to Elixir, whether or not they um, are nice in dealing with the, the the function naming scheme that Elixir uses. Um, but I, I suppose I should be more general in, um, uh, in this day and age. I mean, it's only 2015, right, um, that there, there are multiple languages running on the beam these days. Thanks. Um, so Erlang tracing, um, it seems a little daunting um, because it's complex. But really, it's simple. Really, honestly, there's not much to it, except that there's a whole lot to it. Um, so. If you're not familiar with it, I want to spend a few minutes talking about Erlang tracing and just kind of basically what it is. So for each event, and we'll talk about what, what kind of conditions events uh, are, what happens? So whenever an event happens, we send a message, which is a tuple, and we send it to an event tracer thing. And the thing can be an Erlang process or it can be a port, either a file port uh, or a TCP port. Um, and you can think of that event tracer uh, thing 
as the consumer or sync uh, or uh, destination uh, for trace messages. Um, so if we've got the sync, the sync is pretty straightforward. The source or producer, what can that be? And it could be an Erlang process uh, or a port or the scheduler threads. Uh, there's probably one or two small categories of things that I'm glossing over, but since we're really interested in Erlang processes and uh, beam code execution, uh, we'll focus on that. Um, so I can choose any one process to trace or some processes, or I can say trace them all, trace them all. Um, there are problems with tracing it all, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can do it. Uh, you also have the option of saying uh, uh, any processes that are spawned after tracing starts, uh, or uh, another variation if, if, if a process is uh, linked uh, after tracing starts. And there are an, a, a few other options as well. But um, So now we've, we've chosen, the, we, we know about the sync, we know about the sources, so some of the conditions for the source or the producer, uh, calling a function, whether it's a global uh, inter-module or uh, local intra-module uh, call. We can also filter based on function name, uh, module name, uh, number of arguments, um, using Erlang style pattern matching, sort of, uh, the match, match spec style matching. Um, sending and receiving a message, uh, process is uh, started or stopped to GC, uh, cycle, uh, uh, collection, either a minor or a major one. Uh, process is running or stopped by the, by the scheduler. Uh, if a process is exited, uh, and a few more that didn't fit on the slide. Um, they're just tuples. It's simple. They're just tuples. So the simplest one, uh, the first uh, uh, element is atom trace, and a PID, and then the atom call, and then a MFA, a, a three-tuple, a module function, and the args. Um, now what's a little cool is that the tracing system will give you the full list of arguments, all the arguments. So um, uh, if you want to have an additional kind of uh, tracing logic based on, uh, on the arguments that you see there, um, the, the virtual machine will give them to you, which is kind of cool. Um, there's a variation you can um, ask for the timestamp and some additional information. So the atom at the, at the beginning changes a little bit uh, to tell us that there's this timestamp thing at the end and that's the microsecond uh, Erlang style three tuple, the, the now uh, three tuple for time. So, you, so that gives you the microsecond uh, granularity as long as the operating system isn't lying to you too much. Um, garbage collection events, when it starts and when it ends, and there's some additional uh, information in the stats term uh, to tell you what, what happened um, uh, at the beginning and end of those uh, GC events. Uh, when a process uh, scheduler, takes a Erlang process and schedules it in, starts executing, and when it gets uh, uh, switched out for whatever reason. Um, uh, so again, um, here's an example of showing the, the arguments that you can get in the trace message. Um, uh, if I turn on, uh, there's, a, there's an option that will give you just the arity number. So if you have this really big data term, you end up logging a lot of data, you know, sending these big messages. Um, and Big messages mean larger overhead, um, and if you're sending uh, millions of these messages a second, you probably want them small. So you can ask for just the arity. So here's an example, uh, Erlang monitor of arity one, um, and then uh, the return from uh, item, if you, if you enable that option, uh, the second to the last item there is actually the return value from the function. So you can do some additional uh, uh, post-processing of these events um, if, you, if you care about that value, which is kind of cool. So you can turn this on and off anytime. On your laptop, in production, anywhere, it's really cool. Um, if, if you haven't experienced this or, or talked to someone who foams at the mouth about how great this is to be able to do on, a, on some customer's uh, system off in Siberia while you're you know, comfortable at home in Miami, um, it's really cool. Um, the pattern matching is really quite powerful, even though the, the API is a little weird. Um, uh, it's also quite nifty that the event tracer, if it's an Erlang process, it's train complete. You have the entire power of Erlang and uh, Elixir and LFE to, to process those, those messages, and that's, that's really pretty cool. Um, you can turn it on a production system and then go for coffee and forget that it's on. And um, so, 
you don't necessarily need an event tsunami, which is another problem of generating millions of events. And if you're sending them to an Erlang process, you only have one CPU core's worth of work for that process to consume these events. And if you end up filling that process's mailbox and killing your production system because you ran the process out of memory, don't do that, right? But you know, you're aiming the gun at your foot um, when you turn this on in production um, without some kind of other tooling around it to, to automatically turn things off if you forget. Um, and that's why I recommend using a tool like uh, Redbug uh, or uh, uh, Recon. Um, the API is also frequently difficult to remember. Um, it's probably why there are so many tools for managing it. It's just there's probably 10 or 20 people in the world who actually use it frequently enough to remember what all the cryptic little uh, API thingies are. Um, so the fprof tool is included in the OTP toolkit. Um, it is the most useful of the profilers for our purpose of profiling Erlang code. Um, it's mostly easy to use. Um, it measures wall clock time for uh, calling a, a module function with some argument list. So it's really easy for, uh, for measuring uh, execution time of uh, pure functions, especially um, both time executed by that function and then by all of the, the uh, functions called by it um, and get the stack trace and be able to get a, a report that tells you um, uh, profiling data by call stack. Um, the, the report is a little difficult to read um, uh, Earl Grind and the EAP tool it using uh, uh, together with KCash, K, K Cash Grind um, have, is a better tool. Um, when I talk about flame graphs, um, I think that frequently they're a better, uh, even better tool uh, for visualizing. Um, and I hope to, you'll be all excited and fired up about using them as you uh, as you leave the room. Um, FProf is really not designed for multi-process uh, uh, measurements. Um, the call stack interpretation can be okay or terrible um, uh, due to how it interprets the call stack. Um, and uh, again, this is implemented by Erlang Tracing. So you only have one consumer process, one tracer. Uh, and uh, if I turn this on in all processes in a, on a React system, I can slow it down by two to three orders, orders of magnitude. Um, it's really painful if you turn it on for all processes in the system and all newly spawned. Uh, processes. Um, so uh, I'll switch to flame graphs uh, now. Um, here's some hyperbole from uh, Matt Rainey, um, who was using flame graphs uh, to debug a problem, a uh, performance problem with Node.js. And um, I don't know how he had a function that went from four hours to one second for, <laughs> for 15,000 15, times speed up. Um, but he was really psyched uh, and excited about the, the power of this tool. Um, maybe there's some hyperbole there, uh, maybe. So uh, flame graphs, if you haven't seen them, uh, I'll have a lot of examples uh, coming up shortly. Um, they're invented by Sun Microsystems for being able to visualize uh, profiling data, but do it in, in a much more kind of visually obvious way than the tools they had been using at the time. Uh, it was originally based on Dtrace and Solaris. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of gone viral. Uh, because a lot of people have found them very useful, including myself, um, and some links to more information uh, about them. Um, so here's a flame graph um, of, a, of a React system. Um, and the, the, colors, the colors don't mean much. They're there just to help the eye kind of differentiate the different levels on the graph. You, you do this all in the same color, and it, uh, it, it's not quite the same. Um, so if we zoom, or the y-axis is the call stack depth. And the y-axis, um, left, left to right order, it doesn't mean anything. So something is to the left of whatever. Um, these things are actually sorted in lexicographic order by, by function name. Um, so anything that's to the left or to the right, it doesn't matter. The width, however, has to do with the proportion of samples. And it, again, this depends on the, the uh, uh, the technique used for gathering the samples. It could be simply a number of samples if you're sampling on a, a time-based, like a uh, frequency-based sampling, or it could be 
uh, execution time, wall clock time, or virtual CPU time, or, or something like that. So we zoom in a little further. Um, so here we have process um, 28890. Um, and it is calling React core stats, which is then calling Folsom metrics, which then uses timer TC, and goes back to React KV stat, uh, and so on. Um, and then these things down at the bottom, each one of these represents a different process. So this was 28, uh, 28, 894, and then these were just other, other ones, and they're too skinny uh, to, to see. Um, the tool creates SVG images, and they're actually clickable, so you can zoom in and see, well, what I can, I, you zoom in meaning isolate only stack frames that are immediately above or below where I click. Um, uh, I didn't want to jeopardize the demo gods um, in actually showing the, the SVGs uh, here, um, so I'll, I'll fake it by doing screenshots, as, as I'll see uh, going forward. Um, but they are uh, sort of interactive, um, and you can click on these things. Uh, they also have mouse overs. So I can mouse over here this, this use of uh, lists fold, for example, um, and then it would tell me that there were X number of invocations for this percent of the, of the total number of, of uh, samples seen. Um, so here's, here's a, uh, an example I give uh, in the repo for the eFlame2 library. Um, this is a small React system, uh, and all the processes in React as I'm running a, a small uh, benchmark load, all those purple things at the top are sleep time. So most of the time the system is asleep, or you know, any individual process is, uh, is actually asleep most of the time. But there's so many processes, I mean, you can't see anything here. So we, we, we'll, 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 one of the things that I'll do is I'll post-process the results to remove all of the sleep samples. So now we'll only look at active Erlang process computation, and it's a little less cluttered. Uh, we got rid of all the, the sleepy stuff. Um, some processes are actually big enough now that we can, we can actually kind of read without even zooming. So um, as I was setting up the test, I was doing some stuff at the CLI, and this time right here for process uh, 1333 is related to that as I was, as I was actually doing the samples. Um, React core statistics is this chunk, this chunk, that chunk, and that chunk. So we're spending a lot of computation time actually doing stats inside of React. Um, um, so um, I then post-process the results again to take all of the, the uh, and I'm doing this with awk and said, by the way, um, to collapse all of the samples to remove the individual process identifier from the, from the stack trace. So now all of those stats things all fall into one great big lump here, and we see that it's taking 25, almost 30% of the CPU time, and if I mouse over it would tell me it's like 27 point, point uh, whatever it is. Um, and it, we can see that lists fold is doing it quite a bit, and we're, we have some uh, Erlang NIFs uh, also taking a, a fair bit of time. And if I were interested in that part of the subsystem measuring at this time, I could zoom in and, and do some more work there. But I'm actually interested in another, uh, another problem right now, is a particular uh, vNode, because this is the code I'm interested in profiling. And if I look at it, uh, React vNode, process uh, 450, it's sleeping most of the time. Okay, so we'll, we'll ignore the sleep time, and we get something that looks like this. So um, it's spending all of its time under this current workload doing genfsm handle message. And I know from the work that I'm applying, doing puts to the React database, this is exactly the function that should be executing. Um, and it splits its time between doing a get, because the React, um, it will do a get uh, to see if the key already exists from the back end. And if so, um, if it does exist, then it will merge values based on vclocks and whatever else before doing the put. And we actually have the put uh, activity happening. Uh, where is it actually happening? It's really small, actually. Um, I had also captured um, uh, some background process asking for statistics about how many keys are, are in this particular vNode, uh, this, this particular portion of the database. Um, and so um, that actually was taking more time than the puts that I was doing, or, which is a little scary. Um, Maybe we should look at that uh, instead of the, the, the puts that I was trying to do. So um, there are three methods for, for creating these things. Uh, 
Um, you can profile the VM using standard techniques, uh, using Brendan Gregg's flame, flame graph toolkit. It's really cool, but it tells you what's happening in the guts of the virtual machine. Um, it doesn't tell you things about particular Erlang processes uh, or what Erlang code they're executing uh, most of the time. Method two, uh, Vlad Key's eFlame library. Um, uses Erlang tracing with all of its strengths and weaknesses, um, and it's not always accurate about its call stack reporting. Um, I've got a variation of it called eFlame2. It has a couple different methods for call stack um, uh, calculation. It can use Erlang tracing or not, with all the strengths and weaknesses. Um, you can use a patched VM to have lower uh, trace event overhead. I'll talk about those patches in a moment. Um, I hope maybe it has an easier to use API, but I'm the only person really using it, aside from a couple other uh, folks at Basho, so I don't know actually if it's easier to use or not. Um, pull requests are gratefully accepted. Um, it's not always ac uh, accurate about the call stack reporting either, um, which is really annoying. Um, but that's why you should always measure and don't trust any one tool, but try to get some confidence uh, by confirming results with multiple tools. Uh, so uh, to create the flame graph, uh, you start a workload on the system, keep it running for the duration of the measurement, uh, use the measurement framework from previous slide, um, then you convert the raw measurements to the standard flame graph input file format, uh, generate a SVG image, and then if you need to convert that to another graph uh, format, um, you can do that if you wish. Um, here's some uh, goop about how to do that. Um, I hope it's not too difficult. Um, you can look at it uh, later, or I can talk about it uh, during the question period. Um, so the eFlame 2 library, one of the things I did for the, uh, 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 sorry, um, the current version, or uh, current method without patching the VM uses a very scantily documented um, uh, match spec option called process dump. Um, and this creates the same summary text that you would see in an Earl, Earl core dump uh, text file. And on a React system, each one of these messages can include a, a, a a blob of this info that's 15 kilobytes or more for each trace event. Um, that is what it is. So I'm only really interested in, the, in the, the call stack and all this other info, which looks like this. If this text looks familiar, this is the, this is the same text that is delivered to you in these trace messages. And I don't care how many messages are in my mailbox queue. I certainly don't want to know the contents in CPU expensive to compute ASCII format, uh, or the process dictionary, or you know a lot of other stuff. I want the call stack. That's what I want. I want the call stack. So we're going to hack the VM, uh, and I added another uh, match spec called process backtrace that only uh, formats in C code um, the stack trace and the stack trace only. Um, and um, there are a couple of uh, different functions with a, a slightly different suffix in the eFlame2 library to use this uh, style of generation. Um, so like I said, I can really slow down a React system a hell of a lot by turning on tracing on all of these processes. Um, Time-based sampling, like gprof has been using for, for decades, uh, or dtrace, have very little overhead. Um, and if you just uh, have enough time to gather the samples, you can generate statistically valid uh, profiles um, using this method. But gprof and dtrace, they don't give you any information, again, about what Erlang process is running at the time um, and what, the, what beam code uh, is being executed at that time. If you're a dtrace magician or no one who could help with this uh, problem, uh, please let me, uh, let me know. Um, but um, uh, I'll gloss over the, the, the VM hacking here and how to build it. Um, I created an async thread that uh, all the code I added, by the way, uses the word goofus to make it very clear that this isn't Ericsson-approved code, at least not quite yet. Um, but it basically sleeps for a period of time, and if there's a global variable um, that is set by a debugging BIF, um, if that's enabled, then for each of the schedulers, for their, for their uh, scheduler, um, uh, for their, uh, uh, their scheduler process uh, structure in C, we set a flag, we set it to 42 because that's the answer to everything. And then we go back to sleep 
we just loop. And um, inside Beam EMU, for interpreting every uh, Beam bytecode, we insert this check called goofus check. And if that flag is set, um, then we write a time sample. And then we just add goofus check to a lot of lines in this already really huge um, and not particularly beautiful source file. And then um, uh, here's what happens when we actually want to write a particular uh, uh, time sample. We get the process information um, uh, coming from the VM, create a temporary buffer, we print some stuff, we fwrite it directly to uh, using the C library uh, uh, fwrite function. We destroy our temporary buffer, and we, we go on. Um, and uh, it's really ugly, um, you know, even for a hack, uh, I suppose, with some macros. Um, if we wanted to pursue this technique for real, and um, uh, I can hide it a little bit, um, it doesn't see a lot of stuff that happens inside the virtual machine. Garbage collection um, uh, happens kind of in between execution of like beam opcodes, right? Um, it can't see async file I.O. activity. It can't see uh, port activity or deferred work, auxiliary work items, uh, all that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that you can't see with this method. Um, uh, it might have some bias in favor of functions that are, uh, that, uh, are immediately scheduled in by the scheduler um, when, uh, immediately after the flag is set. Maybe. I don't know. Um, it does have very little overhead. So on my laptop, um, instead of uh, 50 to 300 times slowdown on React, I see something like 2 or 3 percent, uh, even sampling uh, every 7 milliseconds or every 3 milliseconds. Uh, so that's very nice. Um, it's more accurate a lot of the time, but not all the time. Um, that's a measure, or that's a thing of uh, ongoing work. Um, here's what these new trace files look like. They contain the PID, program counter, uh, continuation pointer, um, uh, additional stack trace, doodle, a dot with a uh, on a line all by itself, because uh, if we had an SMTP uh, aware parser, um, we can reuse some code, and then we just repeat. Um, it's not too hard. Um, and uh, I already stepped through some of the, most of the graphs in this tutorial, but there's a lot more uh, explanation to, uh, to go along with it. Um, uh, just as a reprise, and at the end of my talk, this is the last slide. Um, uh, be active in your profiling, in your benchmarking uh, in general, whether it's an Erlang system or, uh, or anything else. Um, but please don't assume that some function that you're particularly interested in, that it's actually being called, like confirm it. Um, and uh, don't assume that it's particularly fast or slow, like by, by guessing or something like that. Um, measure it and also uh, try to be aware of that uh, uh, any measurement technique, even, even ones that have been around for decades, uh, they all have their flaws. So if you can confirm your measurements using multiple techniques, you can get some extra confidence in what it is you've actually uh, measured. And uh, with that, um, I went really fast. Um, I, I can go back and look over some of the other slides. Uh, any questions you have, uh, I'll take them now. <laughs>